Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us here on the program. Where we cover the most interesting live trials and legal stories in the news today. We are going to be live in at least two courtrooms, have a lot of cases to discuss, so let's get started. This is an interesting case. It's a bit complex, a lot of players, a lot to break down. So joining me to help make sense of this case is who better than judge, uh, juvenile judge and trial attorney, Judge Ashley Wilcott. Judge, great to have you here. I'm so happy you're here to break this down. I don't know if we've had a chance to talk about this case yet, so I'm curious. It's a little bit complicated. What's your perspective on it? It's really complicated, and one of the things Rachel just showed that I love as a judge is the demonstrative evidence and the diagram that they show with the fire pit and where the deceased were, and so you can get the entire picture as a jury. Otherwise, it's very hard to understand. There's some more pictures of what was recovered at the crime scene, what the crime scene looks like, because, you know, Jesse, this is a unique case in that there are pieces of evidence that are missing. What I mean by that, for instance, is an eyewitness said that the gunman came in wearing masks. Well, what's the one piece of evidence that no one says they found on the defendant, by the defendant, close to the defendant? A mask. So there is a lot that the jury's going to have to be spoon-fed in this case. Well, let me ask you this. The evidence against the defendant so far is we can put him there. He was shot, so he was there. Uh, they also found bullets in his pocket that match bullets that were found in the BMW that he was found next to. Uh, and those bullets are the same caliber uh, of the revolver that was found um, by the getaway car. They believe the revolver was next to this rifle and that these are the murder weapons. His ID was also found in this BMW and in this BMW was a uh, rifle case. Now, we're starting to understand exactly how these different pieces fit together. Is he just an innocent party who came there with some guns but had no intention to kill anybody and didn't kill anybody? I don't you think he's me. an innocent... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Jesse. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I don't think he's an innocent party. I don't think any of the individuals involved are necessarily innocent of something, right? Like possession of firearms, some of the other charges. However, you know, just because all of those things you just said are true, it doesn't mean or prove that he is the man who pulled the trigger. That's what the prosecution has to prove. So it, it remains to be seen if they're gonna be able to accomplish that or not. Well, I'll tell you what, let's just, we're waiting to go live and we could jump live any second. Let's go back to the prosecution's opening statement where they tie all these pieces together, together and explain their case against Mr. Vasada. Okay, Judge, one of the people that's a really important figure in this case, if I had my trading cards for the Christopher Vasada trial, he would be the key one. I'm talking, of course, about Charles Verpagel. Now, he was the host of that party. This is where the shooting took place. He was a witness for the state, key witness, testified against Mr. Vasada and said that the defendant was never a house guest of his. He So any kind of testimony on the, or any kind of thing where the defendant says he was a friend of his and he was at that party, that's not true. Now, what do you think about his testimony? What do you think about him as a witness? Well, I found him credible. I don't think that there was any reason that I would think he wasn't telling the truth or wasn't being honest. And certainly... You know, why is he going to make up and say, I don't know him. He's not a friend of mine. He wasn't invited to the house party. Now, you know, here's the other thing. And, yeah, I see him there being brought in in handcuffs, but I still found his testimony to be credible. The other thing in this is two words. An eyewitness count is so um, important, Jesse, when it's circumstantial evidence. And that's all this case is. And the prosecution has to put it all together. I think he was I think he was a pretty good witness. Yeah, he didn't outright say I saw the defendant. He was a shooter. He describes characteristics of the defendant at a certain point. And he did seem credible. But like you said, he comes out in chains because he's currently serving serving a federal prison sentence, eight years for weapons and drugs charges, because let's not forget at his house was a collection of illegal paraphernalia. My question is, does the jury look at that and say, oh, I don't like this guy. I don't trust him at all. Well, you know, I think that they could, absolutely. But I think what has to happen is somebody has to put in perspective, i.e. the prosecutor for the jury. None of these are stand-up citizens that are not breaking the law, right? All of the individuals involved being called, these individuals involved have other charges, have other sentences, have done things that are criminal activity. So you have to point out to the jury, you've got to distinguish between the criminal activity and whether or not this defendant pulled the trigger. 
Yeah, and that, that's a really good point because you know, we have cases before where you have very sympathetic victims, uh, and here you have it as well. And, and the, the, the idea, though, is just because, you know, and the, there's been talk about Sean Henry, one of the victims, he was involved in illegal activity. You don't want to taint um, the, you don't want to ever cast light um, on the victims and say, well, their lives don't matter in a way, right? Because especially when the death penalty is on the table. Absolutely. And that's one of the key points is, Regardless of criminal activity, it doesn't excuse, it doesn't justify somebody being shot and killed in cold blood. So again, I think those are points the prosecution I would hope would make in closing to compel the jury to differentiate between criminal activity and criminals versus cold-blooded murder. Very well said, Judge. Okay, so now we're learning a lot about the beefs that might have been happening with Charles Vorpagel in his illegal drug business, seeing that there was, there's this conflict. We're learning about a lot of different players, including a guy named Coleslaw. Clearly, I missed my calling in life with a great name like that. Uh, that is the best thing I think I've heard in quite some time in one of our live trials. Uh, Judge Ashley Wilcott is with us. Now, Interesting first thing to note is how secret these communications are. They're using these kind of code phrases, and this is, a sh I'm sure, something you see a lot. We know they're talking about drugs. Would you have had an understanding about that, or at least a, that they're talking about illegal activity? Would you have known that's what's happening here? Only because of presiding over trials, and most of the law enforcement that work in this area of law enforcement are able to testify and do testify about it's not a typical code, right? Like this is not just novel to these two individuals. Typically those involved in the drug trade have the same vernacular that they tend to use. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, what this means more content-wise, are you getting the sense, Charles Vorpagel, this guy had a lot of conflicts going on. And there were some big problems that he was having with other people in his life, and that perhaps the shooting at his house that claimed the lives of three people was really unrelated to Mr. Vasado. What do you think? Yeah, I think that could be it, Jesse, and you're right. If I just look and listen to some of the texts that they were just talking about, you know, he's, he's first of all, uh, with Teddy Michigan, is talking about the uh, he needs money back, he's sending money back. He can't get the bars, doesn't understand. So there's Teddy Michigan's involved in some of those. And then, as you brought up, Coleslaw, who's talking about, um, you know, so you didn't want to send it out. And then he says, well, the address looks wrong. So there are different people involved. All of that means there's a lot of nefarious activity going on, and he may have been more involved, just like the defense alleges. Teddy from Michigan, Coleslaw. This is the group that I don't know if we asked for, but we sure did need today. So now we're hearing the cross-examination and we're learning more about uh, Christopher Vasada apparently using Marcus Stewart's phone, his co-defendant. Now, Judge, as we listen to these communications and we're coming closer to and on the day of the actual shooting, what are you making of these communications? What should the jury be thinking? Well, first of all, I think the jury's going to think, if you notice the defense, right, they appropriately, given the theory of their case, focused on the calls by the person they're pointing the finger at, who's the homeowner, right? Now, the cross-examination is focusing on, but wait a minute, the defendant was using some phones, and let's see and get into testimony about how long the phone calls lasted, who he was talking to, whether or not there are any texts. So I think the primary point in this is circumstantial evidence suggesting that he was hired, involved in, communicated about actually committing this shooting. It's also difficult because, yes, we can read text messages, but we don't know the content of these phone calls. So we're just seeing when calls are made, how long they are, but we don't really know what the content is. It's going to be up to the jury and up to the, the, the attorneys to characterize what this ultimately is. Let's take a break, though. Uh, when we come back, we're going to jump live and we'll learn more about what's happening and what happened on February 5th, 2017. We'll be back.